سبحان السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله الذي كان بعباده خبيرا بصيرا، تبارك الذي جعل في السماء بروجا وجعل فيها سراجا وقمرا منيرا. وهو الذي جعل الليل والنهار خلفة لمن أراد أن يتذكر أو أراد شكورا. وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله، وأشهد أن نبينا وحبيبنا وقدوتنا محمد عبد الله ورسوله. اللهم صل وسلم مبارك وأنعم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Today بإذن الله تعالى I'm pretty confident most of you are familiar with the title of the discussion today Anybody know? Anybody? Okay Hey Hold on it starts at home. That was the title that I was told. It starts at home. So my question to you is going to be a little interactive here, inshallah. So I'm going to have the, the young folks here definitely partake in this. When we say it starts at home, what are we talking about? It starts at home. It's a rather vague question, or a statement rather. It starts at home. What does the it here refer to in this statement? Further? Is that better? Yep. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Everything. You gotta do better than that. <laughs> what does it refer to? It. I need something. Tahdida. Adab. Okay. Household issues. Household issues. Tarbiya. Barakallah feek. Anybody else? Akhlaq. Mashallah to Barakallah. Alright? You guys are all talking more or less about the same thing. But the reason why I'm drawing your attention to this question is because it's extremely important what the it refers to here. Because if we have different objectives from this discussion, then we are going to have different paths. If you have different objectives, you will have different paths. And if you have different paths, you're going to have confusion. We must all agree what the actual purpose and objective is. So when we say it starts at home, let me summarize it for you what I'm referring to. It starts at home. It here refers to how do we, do we ensure that we, as Muslims here, and our children, our progeny that will come after us, will remain upon the deen of Allah. That's the idea in the future. It starts at home, meaning guidance that we are going to impart to our future generation such that they will maintain their deen long after we are gone. Right? That's the idea. That if you want to see in your children things that you love, then it must start at home. So that's the idea, right? So I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page. We're trying to ensure that we can remain upon, remain upon al Islam and our children will do the same in the light ta'ala. Khairin, inshallah. I want to start off actually talking about a Sahabi al Jaleed, radiallahu anhu, Abu Bakr al Siddiq. And I want to use his story as a case study why this topic is relevant vis-a-vis Abu Bakr Siddiq that's very important so your job today as you guys are in the audience your job is to play the role of those who are around Abu Bakr Siddiq so in your mind think of yourself as either the wife of Abu Bakr Siddiq or the daughter of Abu Bakr Siddiq or the mother or for the gentleman either the son or the brother or the father or the neighbor or even the enemy for that matter but that is your job okay what role are you guys playing guys the people around the people around Abu Bakr Siddiq because the idea here is I want you to focus on the life of Abu Bakr Siddiq some portion of his life that I'm going to share with you all towards the idea that it starts at home that's the goal here right cool we have Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallu ala nabi. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik wa anim ala nabi Muhammad. He said, ma tala'ati shamsu wa la darabat. Right? The sun has never risen, nor has it ever dawned upon anybody better than Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, after the al-mursaleel wa nabiyyim. 
There's nobody better than him. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was a close friend, an intimate friend of the Prophet when they were young kids. Then he remained as his friend in the days of Jahiliyyah. He remained his friend and his close companion when he was the first one to be called to Islam from the Riyadh and he accepted. Then he remained with the Prophet in Mecca when all the different types of difficulty they endured and he remained with him when they traveled and he remained with him as a companion and then he remained in the place of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa after he passed away. That was the companion of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam began to experience immense difficulty as soon as he began to take the da'wah outside to the public when he was told, give da'wah to the people. He goes and he calls the people, immediately the Quraysh turn on him. They begin to persecute the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're trying to harm the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was an anomaly in the sense that when Abu Bakr Siddiq was given da'wah to by the Prophet, he immediately accepted. No hesitation. That's why the Prophet said, there is nobody that I call to Islam except Aba Ali wa Taraddad. The person, he either refused or had some hesitation, some reservation. Let me think about this. Illa ma kana min Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu except for Abu Bakr Siddiq. I called him and he responded. That's him. Now the Quraysh are beginning to persecute the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam goes to the Kaaba. He's about to pray. All of a sudden, the people, some of the person, they come screaming to Abu Bakr Siddiq. Ya Abu Bakr, atrik sahib, go save your friend. فَإِنَّ الْقَوْمْ يُرِدُونَ إِلَاءَ The people have gathered to harm him. So Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu immediately rushes out. He goes to see the Prophet, he's praying, and the Quraysh are gathering around him to harm him. And he says to the people, Are you going to kill a man simply because he says that my Rabb is Allah? And he has come with all the proof that you're looking for? Abu Jahl says to him, Tell your friend that let him not bring his face in front of us. He says, كَيْفَ أَمْنَعُهُ وَهُوَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ How am I going to tell him to do something, prevent him from coming to public, when he is the Messenger of Allah? إِنَّمَا أَنَا خَادِمٌ لَهُ وَتَابِعٌ I am a person who is following him. I'm his servant. That's all what I can do. So Abu Jahl, along with the rest of the Mushrikeen, they begin to hit the, uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq. Right? And then comes this Al-Shaqiq, Utbah ibn Rabi' He comes, and he takes his shoes and he begins to hit Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu until his face changes. He beat him to pulp. He loses his consciousness. He's brought to his home. And when he came, the tribe of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, they gather in the house of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu until he wakes up. He looks at the people around him and says, why are you guys here? Why are you here? He said, you were almost killed. And if you were killed, we were going to take revenge because of you and we were surely killed. He said, oh, leave, all of you leave. He commands all of them, get lost. And they go outside. And he looks at his mother and he says, Ma What did the Prophet ﷺ do? How is the Prophet ﷺ? He said, all of this happens to you and you ask me about Abu Bakr, uh, Muhammad ﷺ? He said, tell me what happened to the Prophet. How is he? She said, I do not know. He said, go ask. Fatima bint al-Khattab, the sister of Umar al-Khattab She goes and asks him what happened. He said, I can't really tell you because she's afraid that this person is a non-Muslim, the mother of Abu Bakr Siddiq. She doesn't know. She said, but I can take you to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You can find out. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu Now he's helped as he's walking and he goes to the house of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. And then as soon as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looks at the face of Abu Bakr Siddiq, beaten, bruised, he begins to cry, looking at his friend. We can still cry. Abu Bakr Siddiq says to him, Le musabbi ala. Ya Rasulullah, nothing happened to me. Most important thing is that you are okay. And Rasulullah is obviously he says, I'm okay. Because he's provided the protection. But he says, Ya Rasulullah, with me has come my mother and she's outside. Oh Ya Rasulullah, make dua to Allah that Allah guides her. Because indeed she is a mother who is very, very kind and merciful to this person, meaning himself. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
makes dua to Allah that Allah guide the mother of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And he immediately goes out to see his mother and as soon as he gets there, she says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah accepts Islam immediately. Dua immediately accepted of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Remember guys, what's your role? You're playing the role of people who are around the Prophet sallallahu or Abu Bakr Siddiq. So his mother accepts Al-Islam. Now you have the dua of the Prophet is immediately accepted. Now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa along with Abu Bakr Siddiq are going through the streets of Medina and they can see the punishment that is being administered by the leaders of Quraysh. Allah ala ra'asihim Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl is going around collecting all the people, all the du'afa from the, the weak people from the Muslimin and punishing them. You have Al Yasir, the family of Yasir. He's there. I'm not like Yasir, there's Sumayya, right? Yasir, they're all there, they're being punished. And they no one can protect them. So Rasulullah is looking at their condition. He says to them, Sabran ya ala Yasir, fa inna mu'ridakum jannah. Have patience. Be patient because your ultimate abode is a jannah. Now Sumayya radiallahu anha, she is tied to a tree, beaten, abused publicly by Abu Jahl. Now he sees that he's not getting anything from them. She is very patient. He harmed her so much, nothing is happening. So he says, we want to up the ante. Then he begins to accuse of her things. He says to her, look at your husband, he's about to die. But I do not think that you will be sad because of his passing. In fact, you are going to be happy that your husband passes away because you are in love with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you want to marry him. They punish her physically, beat her. She was patient. But when they harmed her with her wor- the words, she could not bear it. She turns to Abu Jahl and says, she looks at him and then he yells at him. She says to him, Ya Adu Allah, Allah. Ayyuh al-Fahish al O enemy of Allah, may Allah disgrace you. You are extremely lewd and disrespectful. He said, Innaka ahwanu alayya min al-ju'li ala quma. Today, she used to be, by the way, a servant in Bani Makhzum in her in the house of Abu Jahl. She said, today you are less significant even than the garbage that is thrown outside. You are nobody to me at yom. Which is why the poet says, Sumayya la tubali hina talqa alab al-nukri yoman untarina. Said Sumayya didn't care what kind of punishment she was about to get. Abu Jahl could not take it. He takes out the spear, stabs her to death. There goes Sumayya, the first of the Shuhada. Turn comes the Bilal radiallahu anhu. He's also being punished by Umayyah ibn Khalaf. So he gets, Are you not going to fear Allah in this poor person? He said, You are the one who. Anta man min Abu Bakr Siddiq. He said, Bi'ani ya. Sell him to me. He says, Femme, give me how much you want, how much you want for this. He says, I'll take four, I'll buy you When everybody is watching, he transcends all barriers, racial barriers, social barriers. He did not care about anything. And he hugs Bilal radiallahu anhu in that moment, showing the entire world that the moment a person becomes Muslim, all of these differences go away. <laughs> Abu Lahab in Finnari, who is the Hashimit, was the man who filled him in Khurasan. He said, Do not think that your Nasab, your tribe, your family is going to save you from the blazing fire. Abu Lahab in Finnari, Abu Lahab, the uncle of the Prophet, is in the hellfire, who is the Hashimit, and he is from the most noble tribe, Bani Hashim. Was the man who filled him in Khurasan, and Salman al Farisi, the poet is saying, He is in Firdaus, in Jannah. Oh, Khurasani, he's a Persian. Don't think your lineage will benefit you. So Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, is demonstrating again and again to the people his role in society. He saves Bilal radiallahu anh wa arda. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is gathering his people and he's telling the people, this is the time for you to donate for the sake of Allah. Abu, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anh, you know that he's going to, he's going to come with something special. Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he presents a lot of wealth that he has. He gives to the Prophet sallallahu He says, what have you bought? He says, I bought this money. Half of my wealth, Ya Rasulullah, I'm presenting to you. So Rasulullah makes dua for him. Barakallahu fima anfaqt wa barakallahu fima anfaqt. 
May Allah give you barakah in what you gave and what you kept for yourself. And then comes Abu Bakr Siddiq And by comparison, he had less. He says, what have you left for your family? He said, I have left for my family, Allah and his messenger. I have brought all my love. In that moment, Abu Bakr Siddiq, Umar Khattar radiallahu he says, Wallahi, I will never go, I will never go into, I will never ever compete with Abu Bakr Siddiq ever again. He can never be defeated. That's Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as you guys know the story of Isra al Mi'raj. Rasulullah experienced something immense, something miraculous, and he's sitting, and Abu Jahl passes by him. He sees him that he's distressed. Rasulullah sallam, is distressed. And then he sees him, and then he mocks the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says to him, Ya Muhammad, has there come to you any revelation that you would like to share with us? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says to him, Yes, I was taken from Dar al all the way to Bayt al Maqdis, and I came back. He says, You went and you came back within the same night? He says, Yes. So he said, are you going to repeat what you just said to me if I'm to gather the rest of the Quraysh? He said, yes, I'll say the same thing. Abu Jahl immediately goes out to the people and said, everybody come here, come here. Listen to what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has to say. Because he knows all the effort that they have made to discredit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it has failed thus far. But today his work has been done easy, made easy for him. Rasulullah himself is going to discredit himself. So he called Abu Bakr Siddiq. Have you heard what your companion is saying? He said, no. What did he say? He said he went from Mecca all the way to Bayt al and he came back in the same day. <coughs> Abu Bakr Siddiq he says, did he really say that? Abu Bakr Qala. He said, Bala. He actually said that. He said, okay, if he said it, فقد صدق. If he said it, He's telling the truth. I believe that he's getting revelation in Sabri Samawat. Morning and in the evening. Why is it difficult for me to believe that he would go from here to Bayt al It's not that difficult. He goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abu Bakr Siddiq. In that moment, Rasulullah is praying in front of the Kaaba and all of the people are surrounding. And they are all confused. How can Muhammad Sallallahu even claim this? Everyone is confused. Even some of the people who are weak in their Iman, they're confused. What happened? Some even turned back on their deen in that moment. Some weak iman. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu wa he goes, he stands behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he waits until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he finishes his salat and then he turns to the Prophet and he goes to the Prophet, kisses him on his forehead and he says, Wallahi, sadaqt, sadaqt, sadaqt. You have told the truth. You have told the truth. You have told the truth. While everybody else belied the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in that moment, in that moment, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam granted him the title as siddiq the one who testified to the truth of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam. Why am, I, why am I sharing the story of Abu Bakr siddiq radiallahu Because there's something important that is happening in the life of Abu Bakr siddiq that we need to take heed of. When the Quraysh had picked out Abu Bakr siddiq radiallahu anhu, he was passing by and Ibn al a person like you is going to be kicked out. A, a person like you never gets kicked out. <laughs> you are a person who, who always takes care of your kin. <laughs> you take care of the poor. <laughs> and you are a person who is generous to the guest. <laughs> and you are the person, when it comes to supporting the truth, you, are never, you never shy away. You're always there. A person like you, can never be kicked out. Instantly enough, interestingly enough, you notice the exact same sentence that Ibn Qayyim mentions, the way Ibn Dawudna described Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an was the exact same description that Khadija radiallahu an warda. She is the one who described the Prophet sallallahu alayhi in that same description when he first received revelation. There's a perfect correlation between Rasulullah and his close companion Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu and that's not a coincidence because he took the akhlaq of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now I'm come back, coming back to the question it all starts at home the daughter of the uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu who are they? who can name the daughter of the Prophet uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq? anybody? Aisha 
Aisha radiallahu anha. Anybody else? Asma. Asma bin Abi Bakr. Very good. What about his sons? Abdullah. Abdullah. Who else? Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman. Hassan. MashaAllah. All of these are his children. The result of all the things that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anha has been doing, everything that you're seeing from him, what is the result of it? What is the outcome of this? Every single person in the family of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anha, without exception, every single person is not only a Muslim, but everybody enjoys the status of a Sahabi. That is a unique status that no other Sahabi, perhaps no other Sahabi has, except Abu Bakr Siddiq. Every member, his father, his mother, his children, all of them have become Muslim. Remember, this ties into the discussion, starts at home. If you want your loved ones to be guided, if you want yourself to be guided, your children to be guided, all of the people to be guided, it starts with you. It has to start with you. Because you must be the change you want to see in your own children, in the people around you, in your parents, in your neighbors, in your loved ones, in your friends. Everybody was affected by the akhlaq of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Every single person. And that is the point that I want to make today. That when we say it starts at home, it means that we have to actively live out the life of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Which is what some, something that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he did. And that was a reward. So, an important thing I want you guys to pay attention to. And this, for many parents, by the way, I, I don't know if you guys know, but in Texas, I'm, a, I'm an Islamic student, a Quran teacher, and Islamic school. And many times parents come to me and they say to me, you know, um, my child is in ninth grade and I teach 11th grade. You know, they uh, they used to be very, very obedient to me, but now they are completely changed by the time. Ninth grade, they were good. By the time they left, they have completely, you know, abandoned their role. What has happened? Can you please do something, talk to them, something can happen. And I always look at those parents and I have immense sympathy for them because I know what they're going through. Because they see their loved ones. They literally see the people that they value and love the most slipping away from their hands and they can't do anything about it. So they go from person to person asking, can you intervene? Can you intervene? They come to the imam, the youth director, anybody, somebody help me out here. For those parents who might be in that situation, I have one advice for you, all right? Secret sauce, very important. This will help you immensely. And that is you must instill in the hearts of your children the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah is name. The love for Allah and His Messenger. If you do that, especially at a young age, you instill in them from a young age love for Allah and His Messenger, then I guarantee you, bi-idnillahi ta'ala, that ultimately your children will show impacts in their life that will please you. I can almost guarantee it. And why is it that I'm asking you to love? Because when you love Allah and His Messenger, your path, your, your path becomes easy. Your job becomes easy as a parent. If your child loves soccer, do you have to force him to go play soccer? Do you have to force him to go play soccer? You don't. If your child loves to play video games, do you have to say, Abdullah, you haven't played video games all day? Ya Allah, let's go. Do you have to do that? You never have to do that. Ever. If you teach your children the love of the Prophet and Allah is from a young age, then all your hard work is done for you. They already love Allah and His Messenger. They will naturally gravitate towards what Allah and His Messenger have to say about their life. Naturally. Your work will be done. I'm telling you. That is a point I cannot emphasize enough. Teach your children from a young age to love Allah and His Messenger. And that begs a very important question. And the question is, how do we teach our children the love of Allah and His Messenger? You tell them, Abdullah, love Allah and His Messenger. Does it work that way? Most certainly not. They must see in you, O oh father, O oh mother, they must see in you that in everything that you do, you are demonstrating your love for Allah and His Messenger. You must demonstrate it. You can't tell them. If I keep telling my students that Salah is important, and then when the Salah is, I'm, I'm the last person to join Salah, what message are they getting? They see their teacher coming to Salah, the last person. And I'm telling them all day, Salah is very important. Don't be late to it, don't miss it. And I'm coming late to Salah. 
What message am I giving him? It can't that it can't be that important. You yourself are not showing up. The point I'm trying to make, you must embody the love of the Prophet and Allah Azza wa Jal in your life. They will see it. Your child will see you, the father, that when the time for salah comes, he puts everything aside. He gets immediately and he goes for salah, he's focused. They will learn immediately and pay attention. Allah has made the job easy for you. Your kids, they love their parents. They want the attention and the approval of their parents. A child looks to his father and he thinks his father is a superman. He, he argues with other kids. Oh yeah, my father can do this. Because they hold their own parents in high regard. And that is a resource that we had, an advantage that we have, an animal that we have, that we're completely wasting it. And then when years pass by, 17, 18 years, then we come, oh, yeah, Imam Sam, please talk to my kid. He doesn't listen to me. As was the case with the man who came to Umar ibn Khattar radiallahu with his son, he comes to him and he says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, my son does not listen to me. So Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar al-Khattar radiallahu anh, he takes him, that child or young man, and he begins to explain to him the importance and the, and the rights of a father. So after he's done explaining to him, the young man asks, Yes, Ya Abir you told me about the hukuk of the father over his kids. Are there hukuks for the children over his fathers? He says, Of course, what are they? He says that he should find for you a suitable mother, a good mother. He should give you a good name. And then he should teach you things from the Quran. He said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, my father did not do that. He did not choose for me a good mother. He chose for me a name that is terrible. And he has not taught me anything from the Quran whatsoever. So Umar al Khattab, when he goes to the father and he says, Wallahi, you have wronged him way before he ever wronged you. You have to demonstrate the love of the Prophet through your own action. So let's give some practical advice as to how we can do that, okay? And the best way you can do that is by teaching your children the seerah of the Prophet Teach your kids. Somebody might say, uh, brother, uh, I would love to, what you're saying is great, but I really don't know the seerah of the Prophet I, I don't know much. I'm not a learned person. Yeah, then learn. Learn. If you really care about the future of your children, Learn what's preventing you. Nothing pre is preventing you except your own laziness. You claim to care about your kids and their future in Islam, but you don't put the effort necessary to ensure their safety, their Islam. If you don't know, you can learn. But you must emphasize and show to your kids, yourself, as a family, sit together and learn the seerah of the Prophet And I want to share with you what Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu, the companion, is one of the ten companions who was given the glad hands of Jannah. What he said, he says, Kunna nu'allimu awladana al-maghazi, wa maghazi Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just the same, what we used to teach the, the battles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in other words, the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to our kids, we used to teach them in exactly the same way we teach them the surah from the Quran. Exactly in the same manner, just the way you send your kids to the, the teacher who's teaching the Quran and he's learning, memorizing. He said, it's in exactly the same manner, Sa'id ibn Waqas is saying, we used to teach our children the seerah of the Prophet to ensure for them that they are going to one day reflect on what they are learning in the seerah of the Prophet and they will begin to live out those same experiences of the Prophet. Now, there are many issues that we're facing, and I don't want to belittle the experiences that we have as uh, family members here and adults here. There's no doubt there's a lot of challenges outside. A lot of challenges exist outside, right? You guys can, actually, you know what, let me give you the room. What is the biggest challenge to our children's Islam outside, or our Islam for that matter, in our society? Somebody raise your hand, share something. Public school. Public school, why? They teach secularism. Secularism. Okay, they, they're teaching ideas that are foreign to our worldview. Okay, good. What else? What else? I'm gonna have to point to somebody now. Teach them immorality. Uh, immorality? Like what? Um, sexual stuff. Okay, they're teaching them things about you know all kinds of sexual perversion, right? But that's a danger to us. All of these things, without a doubt, they pose a danger. But let me tell you something. The biggest danger 
to your kids' future in Islam? Ready for this? It's you. It's you. The biggest danger. What do I mean by that? Because when we say it starts at home, if you are doing your job at home and teaching them and making for them an environment that is conducive to their iman inside the house, nine out of ten times, what the people are doing outside will not impact you. Nine out of ten times. If you are doing your job well. If you're doing your job well. Because they will recognize the falsehood for what it is. They will know it. But if you're not doing it, that is difficult. That is very, very difficult. So I want to give you some... Uh, appreciation for what kind of challenges can come about if you are giving your children messages that are mixed, mixed messages, right? When you tell somebody the importance of don't lie, but then when you speak, you lie. What is the message that your children are getting? It's not all that important that you should be truthful. If you tell your children, which is what many Western families will do, they will tell their kids as they're drinking their beer, don't do this. They're smoking cigarette or they're doing uh, a drug and they'll say, don't do this. The child sees that, their parents are telling me not to drink alcohol, but in their fridge is filled with alcohol. What kind of message are they giving them? Mixed messages. The, they, they, the, the saying goes, do as I say and not as I do. Ahsan, mashallah, tabarakallah. Look, when it comes to giving mixed messages, there are two types of mixed messages that people can give. One is easy. The ones I gave you an example of, those are very easy mixed messages. When you tell somebody, and you do the opposite. Are you going to tell people to do some good things, and then you don't do it yourself? And you're the one who's supposed to be learning. Are you not going to use your brain? That's easy. When you tell somebody to do something, but you do the opposite, that's an easy contradiction, easy mixed messaging. But I'll give you something more subtle, more challenging to think. Most people cannot recognize it. Dysfunctional family. Dysfunctional relationships. They give mixed messages. What do I mean by that? Baba, you have been teaching me the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You've been teaching us about the akhlaq of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But you and my mom, you guys are always fighting with each other. You're cursing each other. You're yelling at each other. The family is torn. This is the more subtle mixed message that you're giving them. You're teaching them one thing, but in your lip experience, you're showing them something else. It's not a clear contradiction. I said something and I didn't do it. But in your actual day-to-day -day relationship with people, you're not living out the experiences and the teaching and the values of the Prophet And that's a mixed message. And I'm telling you this anecdotally as an experience from a teacher. I teach a lot of students, and I've seen this time and time again. Children that come from families that are not, because I get to see the parents' parent-teacher conference, I sit with them, I talk to them, and I see them, and I can see, I'm teaching these students certain values, and I meet their parents, and they are fiwad in ah, they are a different planet altogether. Their worldview is different. Now the child, he's getting one line of message in the masjid, or in the school, and when he goes home, he's getting a completely different message. Guess what happens to the child? Who is he going to prioritize, his parent or the teacher? Who do you think? It depends on the age. He, well, good answer. It depends on the age, but more nine out of ten times the child, when he goes home, and he sees his parents do exact opposite what his teachers tell him, he's going to follow his parents. You know why? He's like, if what the teacher was saying, if what the imam was saying, if what the youth director was saying was really that important, then my parents would have done it. Clearly, it's not all that important. So, no problem. And the biggest evidence of that, you will find, the biggest evidence of that, and I'll prove it to you. How many people, when they go to school, they send, even to Islamic school, parents send their children to Islamic school, and when they get the report card, they look at Islamic cities, they got 75, and he says, uh, signs, 75, same grade, but the parents are more upset about why did you get such a bad grade in, in your chemistry class. But they're not showing the same level of concern about Islam to or Quran. That's a proof, that's a proof right there that students who come to class, they don't really care about Islam to as much or the Quran class as much, but they're really caring about, oh, I have a math test today that I must focus on. 
Why are they having, why do they have that attitude? Because they know their parents, when they go home, they'll ask not about your Quran grades, not about your Islamic studies grades, they'll ask, why are you failing the chemistry class? So they, they're getting that message right there that, oh, this class is a, it's not all that important. What's really important is my math class, my chemistry class, right? That's the message that you're giving. And you don't want to do that. Never give mixed messages to your children because that is a detriment to their future. Anyways, I want to give some takeaways before I end it and I'll open up for inshallah questions. Some takeaways. What do I want you guys to walk away with at the end of this discussion? Number one, the biggest challenge to your children in Islam is you. Understand that very well. The biggest challenge to your kids' future, Islam is not LGBTQ, whatever else going on outside or the teacher. It's you. That's the biggest number one challenge. Okay, that's the takeaway number one. Number two, do not ever give your children mixed messages. Don't do it. Don't tell them one thing and do the opposite. Don't do it. It's going to completely put them off. How many times, you don't have to share this answer by the way, it's a rhetorical question. How many times we as a community member know the sheikh, their children are really misguided. The people we look up to as a leader of the community, their children doing drugs. I'll tell you personally, I have mashayat come to me because I'm starting to the teacher, they come to me and say, can you please talk to my kid? Like, so the food, well, I'm, I'm telling you, they come to and say, Mashaikh, they'll come to me, can you talk to my kids? I mean, they don't want to tell that to people, I don't want to advertise it. But why is that happening? Why is somebody so knowledgeable, their kids are not following Islam? Number one reason, because their children are getting mixed messages. Because those same people who are on the mimba, giving, teaching people all these important things, when they are inside the comfort of their home, they're not living out those same ideals and morals and values. So the child sees it, well, you say one thing in public, and you do the opposite at home. This is not nifaq. I, have, I don't want to hear anything from you. I've seen your reality. So they don't listen. That's the number one reason. So that's takeaway number two. What was that first takeaway, guys? What was the first takeaway? We're the biggest challenge. The problem is you. Yeah. Recognize that. Number two was the mixed second takeaway. Mixed do not give mixed messages. And last but not least, learn and teach your family the seerah of the Prophet Earlier I said something that a companion of the Prophet, he said something about learning seerah. Who was it? What did he say? Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. I said, MashaAllah, you guys are paying attention. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. What did he say? We used to teach about the Prophet. He said, we teach our children. The Maghadi, the battles of the Prophet, the seerah of the Prophet, just the way we teach them, teach them the surah from the Quran. Now look at this. His grandson, his grandson, Sa'id ibn Waqqas, his grandson has something beautiful to share. He says, and Ismail ibn Muhammad, he says, Kana Abi, yu'allimuna Maghazi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to teach us the battles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to say, Ya Bunay. Oh my son, innaha sharafa abaikum. And he used to say to us, Oh my son, this seerah that I'm passing on to you, that I'm teaching you, this is the honor of your forefathers. Do not forsake it. This is the grandson. Sa'adi Waqa said that we used to teach them, the grandson, generation later, he's saying that our father used to teach us the seerah of the Prophet and he used to tell us that this is the honor of your forefathers. Do not waste it. Do not forsake it. And I leave you with that. So I ask Allah to make us all those people who listen to the best of what has been said and follow the best of it as well. Amen. Amen. ارزقنا شربة هنية من حوضه لا نظمه بعدها أبدا يا الجلال والإكرام اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ارزقنا اتباعا وأرنا الباطل باطلا ارزقنا سنابا اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا كلها في القهر وجلها أولها وأخرها وعلى نيتها ووسط One second uh, We ask Allah to forgive all our sins No matter how big they are No matter how, how hidden they are Forgive for us all of our sins اللهم أمين يا رب العالمين جزاكم الله خير تفضل اخي
what do you say about the life of Nuh in regards to the son? It seems like based on all the problems of the parents, what do you say is like the life of Nuh and the things of life of the noble man? Allah Muhammad. And you've heard how the son turned out to be. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Summarize the question. Yes. So the brother asked a wonderful question. He said, you're laying all the blame on the parents or the people that you are the problem. What about the story of Nuh Was he not the best prophet? Was he not the best parent? What happened to his son? Right? That's the gist of your question, correct? Barakallah fi. Very good. I had that mentioned here. I didn't mention it to you guys, but I took note of that. If you look at the story of Nuh it's true. He's, a, he's from the Qur'an Aziz. He's the Nabi of Allah, I told you. He did a wonderful job being a parent. But Allah uses the Anbiya and gives them affliction to teach others. And what is the lesson that we're learning from the story of Nuh alayhi salam? That listen, ultimately, ultimately, guidance is in the hands of Allah. No matter how wonderful a job you will do, there will be a time, those rare situations, anomalies, where no matter how well you did a job, your children will not be guided. It's going to happen. Right? And then you have to, you have to live with that reality. Allah Azza wa Jal is showing us those are extreme situations where things like that will happen. And you have to in that moment recognize that the guidance is not for me. And it's not just Nuh alayhi salam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he loved his, his uncle immensely. Right? He loved his uncle immensely. And on his deathbed he goes to him and he says to him, just say la ilaha illallah and I will testify. I will make shafa'ah for you in front of Allah Azza wa Jal. Just say la ilaha illallah. And then Abu Jahl is right there, right, saying, are you going to turn back from the deen, deen of your forefathers? Abdul Muttalib, are you going to turn back? Knowing, Rasulullah knows that Abu Talib, his uncle, recognizes that the Islam that he has come is true. He said in the words of poetry, Wallahi, inni alimtu anna deena Muhammadin khayr al-adhyani bariyati deena falawla al-malamatu aw hilaru masabbati la wajadtani samhan milaka mubina he said, Wallahi, I have no doubt that the deen that you have come with, O oh Muhammad, it is the best deen that exists for humanity. There's no doubt. But it's not for the fact that I'm afraid my people would say that I've turned against the deen of my forefathers, that I will have this awe, this disgrace, I would have surely accepted your deen. He believed, but then he didn't want to accept it. Right? Those situations will happen. That's why Rasulullah said, I will make a far for him. And he says, you cannot make istifa for the person who died upon kufr. Inna kala tahdi man ahbabt wa lakin Allah yahdi man yasha. Ultimately, our Rasulullah is being taught that guidance is not in your hands. Right? And that's the lesson that we're taking. That yes, there are going to be situations for very few people that you did your job 100% and still fail. It's possible, but that is your test. Are you recognizing that it's in the hands of Allah or not? But that's not... That's not the 99% of the people. That's an anomaly. Also, in the United States, the mother was bad. I said, very good, very good uh, you know, uh, addition there. You have to recognize the role of the mother here. Right? The wife of Nuh salam, was not on the same page. Right? Which shows you what? Dysfunctional? Dysfunctional? Relationships. That sends mixed messages. Right? Barakallahu feek. Very, very astute, uh, you know, observation. Right? Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Oh. What about the social media? What we can do about social media? <laughs> okay. They're always going to come, no matter what, right? MashaAllah, <laughs> Allah. Look, there are certain realities that we cannot escape. No doubt. We cannot escape. But it ties back to, ties back to what I said earlier, that you must embody the change you want to see in your children. So what does that mean here? If you want your children to not be somebody who is completely consumed by social media, then you must show them through your own action that you yourself are not consumed by the phone. It's as simple as that. For example, if I don't want my child, that this person, that my child is completely consumed by social media or the phone, then I have to model it for them. I must model it. If I say, don't be on your phone all day, but I'm always on my phone, what, what am I giving them? Mixed messages. Mixed messages. Can't do that. 
What if you see that Baba walks inside the house, takes out his phone, turns it off, puts it in a pocket right at the entrance? That's it. He's on his phone. And he applies that across the board for everybody. It might be difficult early on. They're going to cry and mourn a little bit early on. But after a while, when you show that there's, there's uh, you, the person has no ifs and buts about it, that's the policy of the house. As a man, you're the leader of the house. And you're going to implement that? They're going to follow. But they are looking to you. Is, is he serious or he's just wishy-washy? He's saying it today, tomorrow he'll go back on it. It's not going to work. It goes back to the same concept. If you don't want them to be consumed, show them that you're not consumed. And then we can hope for the best. I would, Zakala Khair, so the foundation is the same model, the behavior one. I would also add to that, you know, the social media, of course, you don't want them to engage in it so much, so you don't engage in it. But if you don't want, if we don't want our children to be engaged in social media, how much are we engaging our children, ourselves? Like, how are we engaging them? What activities are we doing? How are we engaging our time with them? And if we're not, then how can we fix that? Yeah, so it's a wonderful point. So like, you don't want them to be engaging or engaged by social media as much. Okay, what are you going to replace that with? Substitute. Right? What are you going to substitute that with? You have to. It's like, you know, something that I was saying, you know, I have a very young daughter, and uh, she was playing with something, knocking on something, and I was like, you know what, let me just yank that from her hand so she can't do it. And then I was told, no, no, no. You never take something from a child except that you replace it with something else. If I'm taking from that child from the hand, if you yank it out, they're going to cry. They don't know any better. Is it take one thing, give them something else in its place. If you're going to say, this is bad, don't do it, give them an alternative that is positive, right? And which is why it's something that I will emphasize for you guys that when I was growing up, alhamdulillah, my, uh, my family, something they emphasized very much was the role of sports in our lives, right? Not because we think sports is the end all be all, right? But if you want the kids to stay away from some vice that are in our society, not to get involved in drugs, not to get involved with haram relationships, not to get involved in all these different things that are out there, you have to involve them in something, right? So if these, if your kids are athletes and they're playing, they're too busy training all day and they're going to their game, they won't have time for those things. So it's a, little, a bit of a distraction. A healthy substitute, right? So find something that you can, it doesn't have to be the only thing. They, they might like swimming, they might like archery, they might like horseback riding, whatever it is. Find for them an alternative that is going to substitute for that bad behavior that they will be engaging otherwise. Right? Love to add on. Just go on to make a quick comment. Even though we do all that good stuff for the family to raise the child as Muslim, we still forget to make du'a for them, not to write you know, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I don't know if everyone heard, he said, even if you're doing all of that, don't forget the importance of du'a. The reason why I did not mention the du'a, because for me, as far as I'm concerned, it's a given. For me, it's like, it's, a, it's an afterthought. If a father and a mother is not remembering their kids in their du'a, then they have bigger problems. They have missed the, the mission entirely, right? I'm talking about my assumption here is, that the parents are already making du'a and they don't know what to do. Things are not going up, assuming that. But very good point. The du'a that's a given, you must be making du'a for your kids. You have to, right? What kind of neglect is that that you're not remembering your kids and their guidance and the du'a that you're making? Remember the du'a of the parents? Immensely potent. Immensely. It shows, it has impact on the children. And also I'll add something to that. And inshallah, I'll end with that. Something very important. When you make du'a for your kids, and you can see you, that I saw my father offering salah, nawafi, not nawafi, random times. And they see you pray and they're making dua for you, it will have a profound impact on them. You may not see it one year, two year, 10 year, 15 year, 18 years, but you will see it eventually. And this is the point I'm trying to make. Many times, people, families, teachers, the mistake that they make is that they're saying that I'm giving them, but they're not taking it. I'm doing, but they're not. Remember, it's the long game, guys. It's a marathon. Don't expect that change. When you plant a seed, anybody has that ever done any farming at all? Anybody? Khair, inshallah. If you plant a seed in your backyard for something, whatever that you planted, does it grow immediately? But you've been watering it every single day, making it sit in the sun. Does it grow immediately? It doesn't. 
You're hoping one day it will turn into tree. 30 years goes by, finally it thinks it's a tree. But is it giving fruit yet? Still not giving fruit yet. It's a strong, able body standing in front of you, but the fruit still has not come yet. Continue to do what you do. The fruits will come one day. You may not be there to see it. It's possible. You may pass away. You may not see the fruits of your own labor. But that fruit will come. It will come. And there is no better example of that than the life of the Prophet wasallam. The seed that he planted. Everybody in here, you are a result. You are the fruits of his labor, whether you recognize it or not. Our forefathers, from different backgrounds that we're coming from, they were brought into Islam by the battles that fought by the Sahaba, Allah, and then we became Muslims, right? This was the effort that they put. They didn't get to see their reward. Think of the story of the Prophet and Taif, when he was given the option. Allow me, I'll take these two men to crush the people of Taif. He said, no, no, perhaps from these people will come a generation will say, La ilaha illallah. Rasulullah passed the entire, entirety of Taif. I don't know if you guys been to Taif. I've been to Taif before many times. The entire place was Muslim. Did he get to see it? Some of it, but not all of it, right? So that's the point that I'm trying to make. Sometimes you do not get to see the results of your hard work immediately. You must play the long game. You must be patient, right? Allow for that change to come. And I'll be in the light time. It's my last thing I'm mentioning to you. I remember when I was in Sunday school, right? It's relevant. When I was in Sunday school, we never used to listen to the teacher. We, the worst kids you can imagine, never listen to the teacher, asking all kinds of questions to annoy him. Never. That same teacher, when I was in New York a few months ago, he came and he gave the khutbah in the masjid. And I was attending, and after the khutbah, I went up to him and I gave salam to him. Right? And I gave salam to him, and he saw, at first he didn't recognize, and then he recognized me, and then he became so happy. And I said to him, all your hard work that you put into teaching us whatever you taught us, we are forever indebted to you. You did not see it at the time. But whatever I am today, you have a great role that you played in it. And that is an encouraging thought. That is an encouraging thought. Remember that. You may not get to see it immediately, but it will come around. Because that is a promise of Allah. Allah does not cause the good deeds of the believers to go to waste. Allah doesn't. You only have to do the right thing. That's why the Prophet says, if the day of judgment is about to be established and you have in your hand, a plant. He said, plant it. The day of Jesus is about to happen. Why am I planting this? Because you will get the edge for it. You may not get to see it grow, but you'll get the edge for it. Right? So those are the things that I want to leave with you guys with. That remember guys, it's a long game. And do not ever belittle the hard work that you're doing and do not expect from the youth that they are going to respond to your your hard work immediately. The sisters have a question. Yes, if any of the sisters have a question, you can ask by any means you think. Thank you.